want to start by thanking Lawrence Lab for their wonderful support of science education in our Tri-Valley area and in California. Not only does the lab put on this science on Saturdays, and it has for 14 years, but we learned last week that the scientists at the lab have been instrumental in developing an environmental science curriculum for high schools based on the California science standards. So students throughout California will have a benefit of this work. And we are grateful for the many, many summer learning opportunities that the lab provides all teachers, not just science teachers. And welcome to the banquet. How many of you have been here before? Ah, then you know that everything seems better in the bankhead. How many are seventh and eighth grade girls? Ah, not as many. I want to extend an invitation to seventh and eighth grade girls and their parents to attend Reflections on Your Future next Wednesday at Livermore High. It's sponsored by the Three Valley High School, uh, Three Valley School Districts, and it's a hands-on science activity for seventh and eighth grade girls and their families. The flyer's out in the lobby, and you'll notice that the RSVP was due last Friday, but I know if the voicemail is on Ms. Adelman's phone when she gets there on Tuesday, there will be a place for you. But what is science? The traditional answer is that science is what scientists do, but that's not very informative. I want to suggest that one of the main things scientists do is make very careful observations. And then they ask, why? What did you observe on your way here today? And can you predict what you will observe that is different on the way home? The science we hear about today is space science. Space science is a bit different from the kind you usually think about with controlled experiments. It's not like feeding one set of rats a regular diet and the second set the experimental diet and see which one gained more weight. You just can't do that with space science. You can't put the moon in a different orbit and see what happens to the tides. Space scientists can only make many careful and strategic observations before drawing their conclusions. This morning, we will hear from Stephen Astelos, who does experimental cosmetology. His college and graduate studies were made were in nuclear engineering, with two degrees from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and a PhD from UC Berkeley. Then a postdoc at MIT on a Livermore lab project in axion dark matter. He's also interested in using gravitational lensing and supernovae to weigh the universe. In his free time, he hikes to remote places to find wildflowers, and in the winter, he skis the black diamond runs. His partner today is Tom Scheffler, a science teacher from Granada High School in Livermore. His bachelor degree is in physics and applied math from Western Michigan University. He has a master's degree in astronomy and astrophysics from Berkeley, where he analyzed science, the Hubble Space Telescope images of galaxies. He studied extrasolar planets and discovered the supernova 1998-DT. At Berkeley, he also decided that teaching would be his life's work, and we are delighted that he chose Livermore to practice his profession. So this morning, we have our dark and messy universe, how one particle might light the way. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. I, I just after all that educational background, I just want to let you know that I used to work construction, and every summer I'd come back from school and work construction. My boss would claim that I, were, I was stupider and stupider with construction activities, you know, so I thought I was smarter, getting smarter every summer, but in fact, he thought I was getting dumber, so there's a lesson there somewhere. Um, before we get going, I have a few questions, and there's a few pieces of data I need for my talk. And the first thing, the first piece of data I need is, well, someone has to remind me what the speed of light is. So who wants to tell me what the speed of light is? Over there, young lady. You, the, the, you, huh? Ah, so I, I berated the, um, the, or the person in the earlier talk for giving it in meters, in, in miles per hour, but that's exactly right, 300,000 kilometers per second. And so you get a slinky for uh, your efforts. So what force holds the, planets in orbit around them. Who wants to answer that one? Okay, so you all get slinkies. No, <laughs> um, 
What, uh, so consequently, what planet revolves around the sun most rapidly? Uh, yes, Mercury, excellent. Okay, so a slinky for this young man here in the t-shirt. So that little introduction is kind of the flavor of the talk. I'm gonna be talking about our universe. It's a messy place, we don't understand it very well, but we understand it better than we did, and how one particle could help us solve um, some of the mysteries of that universe. So what I'd like you to learn today is not just limited to what's up here, uh, but in particular, since there are some objectives that you have, We'd like you to know at least what is cosmology. The second thing is get comfortable with the idea that there are unseen particles all around us. When you go and hop in a plane to see your folks or your grandparents or whatever go on vacation, there are particles called cosmic rays that are just running right through that airplane and you get a much higher dose you do on the plane than you do on the ground here. And then finally, and you don't see those particles. And finally, how can we use a radio to detect dark matter? It's that simple. It's almost that simple. So uh, let's see, at the beginning here, we let this Power of 10 video run. It's a six minute long video. And what it showed was the scales that are involved in cosmology. Because for a long time, cosmology just dealt with the universe, big things. But then around the 40s or 50s, people realized that there were a lot of things that cosmology wouldn't tell us without turning inwards, without looking at, at, at small dimensions and particles and considering the effects of subatomic physics. <laughs> so that video, which started off as a one square meter in Chicago and was eventually expanded to a thousand by thousand meter patch there, uh, is the first part of the beginning of the tale of what modern cosmology in itself entails. Modern cosmology entails scales that go all the way down from the, from the uh, size of the proton, 10 to the minus 14th or 15th meters, all the way up to scales of 10 to the 21st meters, which is, or, or larger, which is the scale of our Milky Way galaxy. Those are very large distances. They, they, they make the mind hurt. And so part of the job during my talk today is to make you more comfortable with these incredible distances and uh, something that's way out of the out of the pale in our everyday lives. So the only funny part of my talk is the what is cosmology? And it's, um, it's not cosmetology. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times I get asked that in the course of, of conversations. Cosmology, cosmetology is, I don't even know exactly what it is, but I call it the science, I called it the science of beautification but it's really not at that. Cosmology is understanding how the universe was a long time ago. How do we understand what it is like now? And what will it be like 10 billion years from now? Or 100 billion years from now? That's what cosmology is. And the analogy I used in the first talk I think is still valid. It's, it's as if taking a picture with your camera, the difference between a still photograph and a movie that you take with your camera. Cam uh, cosmology is more like a movie version of the, of the universe around us, and astronomy is a snapshot of the universe. <clears throat> and cosmology was, the term cosmology came, of, uh, it was invented in like the mid 18th century, but it describes a process that is ancient, and the ancient process is to try to relate to the world. Because imagine 20,000 years ago, how did people make sense of comets and asteroids and day and night? Well, they had to come to comfort themselves. They had to come up with some story, and that story was their cos not cosmetology, it was their cosmology. And each culture has a cosmology. We have our own cosmology. Our cosmology is, in, is directly descended from ancient Western, uh, from uh, Greek thought, and it's influenced, you know, when you go to, in high school, you're reading mostly, you know, the classics that were informed by Greek thinking and by uh, the thoughts of that time. And our cosmology, up until very recent times, dealt with an infinite universe that never changed. What a boring place. But there was some activity, there were motions around the, the, the Earth was at the center of the universe and all the stars and the, and the planets revolved around the Earth. 
And that went on all the way in the past, and it would never change. And we no longer, we have a slightly different view of our universe nowadays than that. And this is Im embodied by the, this woodcut here from the late 19th century of this fellow looking behind the scenes, kind of looking backstage here to understand how the puppets are working. And we started at around the end of the century to have a deeper understanding, something that overthrew a 2,000-year-old vision of what the, the way the universe worked. And what helped us get there, the only thing that, I, 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 the only thing that helped us get there, and it, it's not because we're really bright people, it's because we have these great instruments. We have instruments, like we have 100-inch telescopes, 200-inch telescopes, uh, eight meter telescopes and then we have telescopes that are up in space and all of these are enormous advances that our predecessors didn't have and they helped us get really smart and on this on this slide here this is the advantage of having a telescope is the fact that you're taking something like your eye and replacing it with something that is an eye that's as big as the distance between Tom and I. So you get a factor of about 100,000 when you replace your eye with a telescope. All those photons, all that extra light is being gathered over an enormous area. Another factor here is a little bit more subtle. It's the fact that your brain forgets about 30 times a second what it's looking at. It doesn't remember the detail in an image. But just like your camera again, when you take a picture and keep the shutter open, you keep on recording data, and you can do that until your finger gets tired. And when astronomers take pictures of galaxies, they keep that shutter open for weeks on end. Up to, you know, it, it, it's limited by how accurately they can point. And that gives you another factor of up to 100,000. So here's the advantage we had over our ancestors, the, you know, like, um, you know, pre-Galilean times, is we get a factor of, 100, of 10 billion times more sensitivity from telescopes than we do from the naked eye. And the Greek, the ancient Greeks and the Persians and all those other people only had the eye to work with. Nothing else. So that's the first portion of the talk is the, you know, kind of the history of cosmology. What is cosmology? And now moving on to what have we learned about cosmology? What have we learned with all these big, expensive you know, pieces of equipment that the government has paid for? Well, we've learned, actually, that's not so true that the, gov the government pays for it, because telescopes are one of those very few things that have always been privately funded in, in, in large part, because you know, these benefactors. But anyway, let me just say that we have learned that our galaxy is not the only galaxy in the universe. We're one of an uh, unbelievably large number of galaxies and we're nothing, there's nothing special about our galaxy, except that we live here. We live in a local group of galaxies. There's us in the Milky Way here. And we're not at the center of the Milky Way. We're close to the center, but we're not at the center. And then the next biggest galaxy, the only other galaxy you can see in the night sky, of all, keep in mind, of all the galaxies in the universe, there's only one you can see in the night sky. And that's the Andromeda Galaxy. It's two million light years away. These, this is a galaxy cluster here. And then the next galaxy cluster is 60 million light years away. So who's com is anyone in the audience comfortable with the uh, notion of 60 million light years? No, I'm not either. So that's why I have the next slide. It's, um, it's, it's helpful. That's why I asked the question about the speed of light at the beginning of the talk here, is that one thing we know is constant in the universe is the speed of light. So the light speed can serve as a surrogate in time and serve as a surrogate for distance. So we know how fast light is. It never changes. It's always the same speed. That's what Einstein taught us. And it goes around the Earth six times a second. That means, and also, so what that means is that light you see from the sun left the sun eight minutes ago. So that means the sun's pretty far away, right? Because light travels really fast, and it took eight minutes to get here. Two million years ago, the light that you received from Andromeda was, was emitted from Andromeda Galaxy. So that's way back when we, you know, before we had iPods and things like that, way back in the distance. And the light from the Coma Cluster was, the light that telescopes record tonight in, from the Coma Cluster was emitted back when dinosaurs were on the Earth here. And so this is how it goes. And the Coma Cluster is really nearby. The universe is a really big place. 
and there are galaxies that are billions of light years away emitted. We're detecting light from galaxies that were emitted before the solar system was ever around. So, the sec so we learned that we're not alone in the universe, and the universe is a really big place. We also learned that <clears throat> the universe is expanding. And what Hubble found in the 20s, in the, in the, in the 20s was that galaxies that are further away from us tend to be moving away faster from us. So you, this, you may think, ah, so what? But th think about it. For 2,000 years, people thought that the universe was static. There was nothing going on there. But all, in the 20s, we learned, boy, galaxies are moving away from us. Furthermore, the further they are away from us, the further they are away from us, the faster they're moving from us. Which is, and we have a couple demonstrations to, to, to pound that into your heads, because it's a really, it's a, it's, it's a feature of our universe that the further things are away from us, the faster they move. And then we also discovered that the universe has this rich structure that, um, I, that you, can, you, you can just basically solve basic problems about the universe right on your computer by comparing computer simulations to this image here that was taken with telescopes. So um, because the expanding universe is crucial to this talk, we have uh, a couple of demonstrations to, uh, to illustrate it. So first of all, I want to uh, thank a couple of my uh, AP Calculus students for uh, volunteering to uh, help us out today. This is uh, Ryan and Grace. And uh, I am uh, uh, giving the two of you an opportunity that uh, teachers rarely give students, and that is the opportunity to control the universe. And by the universe, I mean this rubber tube with Nerf balls on it. Uh, this is a model for our universe. This represents a small piece of our universe. Uh, as you know, we think of space as three-dimensional. Everything has uh, breadth, depth, and height in terms of mathematics, x, y, and z. We're simplifying things a little bit here into one dimension, so we're going to have all motion along a straight line. And what the, the rubber tubing represents is the fabric of space itself. And each of these, this galaxy has lint on it. Each of these little Nerf balls uh, represents an entire galaxy occupying a certain spot in space. And what Edwin Hubble discovered uh, is that every galaxy in the universe seems to be moving away from us. And there's a proportionality. A galaxy twice as far away from us is moving away from us twice as fast. A galaxy five times as far away from us as another is moving five times as fast. And this led to several conclusions. Some conclusions were correct. And uh, a not so careful analysis of, of the data could also lead to some incorrect conclusions. So why don't you go ahead and, and demonstrate an expanding universe for us. So notice every one of our galaxies is moving away from every other galaxy. And not only that, the farther away two of these galaxies are, the faster they're moving relative to each other because there's simply more space between them. So let's do this one more time. And notice if you pick any galaxy to be, imagine your home galaxy. You can imagine this yellow galaxy is your home galaxy. Imagine this green was your home galaxy. No matter which one you look at, the ones next to it are going to be moving the slowest, and the ones farthest away will be moving the fastest. Let's go ahead and show that again. So what this shows is that although we may come to the conclusion, oh my gosh, everything is expanding away from us, we're in the middle. We're at the center of the universe. That's actually a conceit. Uh, it turns out any point in the universe would observe the exact same expansion, nearby expanding slowly, farther away expanding more quickly. So that kind of gets rid of two misconceptions about the expansion of the universe. One, we're at the center. And two, there is a center. One of the biggest misconceptions about the expansion of the universe and the Big Bang is the idea that, we, that there is a center of the universe. There's a point somewhere out in space where the Big Bang happened over there, right by that exit sign. And the universe is expanding away from that point. The Big Bang was not an explosion in space. The Big Bang was an explosion of space. So the answer to the question, where did the Big Bang occur, the answer is everywhere. Every spot in the universe experienced the Big Bang. And this is something that we see not only when we, we visualize the expansion of the universe, but every single spot in the sky, no matter where we point our telescopes, we see what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. This electromagnetic radiation in, in the microwave part of the EM spectrum 
the same part of the spectrum that pops your popcorn and cooks your burritos, warms up your leftovers. The universe is filled with this radiation. This radiation is going to be thought of as the echo of the Big Bang itself. And we don't see it in one spot. We see it everywhere. One other uh, misconception about the expansion of the universe that I like about this demo is uh, there's a misconception that, well, if the universe is expanding, everything in the universe must be expanding. The galaxy is getting bigger. Earth is getting bigger. I'm getting bigger as the universe is expanding. Well, notice the Nerf balls stayed the size of Nerf balls. They didn't grow. And that's because uh, the gravity that holds our galaxy together, the chemical bonds that hold our planet together, the chemical bonds that hold us together are far, far, far stronger than the expansion of the universe. So if we find uh, ourselves expanding with time, we cannot uh, fault cosmology, and uh, we have to blame our own dietary choices. Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, I have uh, a more two-dimensional uh, demo for uh, helping to visualize the expansion of the universe. What you're looking at uh, is supposed to be representative of the universe as it is today, or at least a, a chunk of the universe as it is today. And every little dot on this page uh, represents a galaxy somewhere in the universe. And I've color-coded a few of them. Uh, this is a green one, red one, a black one, and a blue one. And this is the same chunk of the universe a billion years ago. And it doesn't really appear all that different. You see a bunch of, bunch of dots on a page. But if you look carefully, all the dots on this page are a little bit closer together. They come from an era when the universe was less expanded. And if we want to visualize what that expansion looks like, all we have to do is overlap these two images. Imagine we live in the green galaxy. So what we see is everything in the universe seems to be emanating or expanding away from this point right here. And the farther away it is, the faster it's moved in the same amount of time. This blue galaxy is very far away from the green galaxy and has moved quite a bit compared with the red galaxy, relatively close and moved a small amount. The only way you can move a larger distance in the same amount of time is if the more distant galaxy is farther away. And the nifty thing is, it doesn't matter which galaxy we choose to be our reference point. If I choose the red galaxy, to be our reference point, all of a sudden, the expansion seems to be emanating away from that point. So the moral of the story is, every spot in the entire universe would view the expansion in the exact same manner. And this is exactly what Hubble saw. The farther away something is, the faster it's moving away from us. Back over to you. Thank you, sir. OK, so now, again, on the topic of the expanding universe, for 2,000 years, no one talked about an expanding universe because we didn't know it was expanding. And then all of a sudden, we had to deal with an expanding universe. And who taught us how to ask questions of an expanding universe was um, Albert Einstein. And he did it in two stages. He did it with his theory of special relativity, which taught us how things that are moving really fast away from us, or moving really fast, behave. And he, then he extended that to his theory of general relativity, which taught us how the universe, which portions of it are moving very fast away from one another, behaves. So Einstein gave us the language to understand a dynamic universe, and a universe that is not static as our Greek forefathers thought. So Einstein, pretty smart guy, but he was limited to his equations. He couldn't <coughs> predict everything. He couldn't tell us, for example, how much the universe weighed. One of the, so his equations need two things. His recipe needs two things. He needs to know the mass of the universe, and he needs to know what's in it. And when you know the mass of the universe and you know what's in it, you can solve his equations. It will then tell you what the universe was like five seconds ago and five billion years from now. You will describe completely the evolution of the universe. Oh, he didn't, but that wasn't part of his theory. So. Now, to use a baking analogy, he didn't tell us how big the pie was. He didn't tell us if it was a big old pie with four slices, or he didn't tell us if it was a little pie, a little pie here, with five slices. So those are things this that... working a little better. Those are things that Einstein couldn't tell us. And who does, who's left to do the dirty work here? People like myself, cosmologists and astronomers. So what we're hoping for is a, is a scenario where we go out and measure the weight, we weigh the pie that we take out of the oven, let's say, and we find out that the, when we individually weigh up all the pieces, 
they don't weigh the same. That's really what people live, what scientists live for, are days like that. And actually, we've had more than our share of days like that because for many years, um, well, let me not get ahead of myself. Let me just say that, so Einstein couldn't tell us how much the universe weighed, but in 1974, it was like um, someone told us exactly what the universe should weigh. He kind of said it in a roundabout fashion. He said, I have a really great idea. And this idea leads to a conclusion that the universe weighs one. Okay? That the weight of the universe is one. And one is just an arbitrary number. In fact, the real density of the universe is what he predicted was... That's it, for those of you that want to know, know that. Okay? <clears throat> so he had a great idea, and he said, that's what, your unit, that's what the density, if you will, and I'm call, using weight as a surrogate for density, but he said, the weight of your universe should be one, and if it's not one, then the universe that you live in, he didn't understand, because that universe, as soon as it started off, would have collapsed on itself. Space would be horribly warped, and it would look nothing like the universe we find ourselves in. So it was a really great idea. Everyone was really impressed. It solved all of these problems in cosmology. It solved question, really deep questions. But the problem was, when people went out and weighed the universe, they found that it was 0.1 or 0.3 or 0. It wasn't 1. And that was, a, that was a huge problem at the time. That problem was solved in the late 90s and in early 2000s when people sent balloons, scientists sent balloons and satellites up into space and they used the cosmic microwave background to, rate, to measure the weight of the universe, and they found the answer was one. So that was really a, really a stunning uh, valid, validation of modern cosmology. The, the universe weight was predicted, and then it was found out to weigh one. So, and for this, our buddy, George Smoot, I shouldn't say buddy, um, but nonetheless, our friend George Smoot, is at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, who's got a Nobel Prize in 2006 for this discovery. It was a monumental discovery. It involved measurements that were exquisitely difficult to make. So, after Smoot made his measurements, we found out how much the pied weighed. We confirmed it weighed one. We then no, even before this, though, the conundrum was that when we measured the weight of everything, the weight of kids in the front row, the weight of planets and apples and black holes, everything you've ever studied in school, all that mass of everything you've ever studied could be stuck in this little sliver here, just a, a tenth of a percent of the weight of the universe. Stars and all this stuff, galaxies, just the tiniest fraction of the weight of the universe. That should be a little bit uh, unsettling to, to you. So what makes up the rest of the universe? You and I only make up the tiniest fraction of the weight of the universe. Well, it turns out that some good fraction of it is dark matter. And how do we know that? Well, there's whole books written on dark matter. There's 50 different pieces of evidence for dark matter, but this is one of, one of the pieces that's easiest to explain. When you measure, just like, you, just like Brahe and Kepler measured the velocities of the planets around the sun, Astronomers measure the rotation of objects in, solar, in galaxies, and they plot them. They plot, as a function of distance from the center of the galaxy, the velocity, how fast these things orbit around the center. They find that they get a curve that looks like this. But if there were no dark matter in these galaxies, this curve would look like this. And the, the really surprising thing is, look at this. The visible matter stops all the way, the visible matter stops here, but the galaxy is still rotating very rapidly all the way over here. Something's causing this galaxy to rotate much more rapidly than the mass in that galaxy. And furthermore, every galaxy that you look at, almost every galaxy they study, you get the exact same behavior. So this discrepancy right here is very strong evidence for dark matter. And it's not the only evidence. I said there's 49 other pieces of evidence for dark matter. So, here's the story. We, we know the pi. We know how much it weighs. We know how much of it is dark matter now. We know that you and I make up a tiny fraction of it. Gas, hydrogen gas, makes up another 4%. And then this wacky stuff called dark energy makes up the rest of it. And this dark energy 
is consider the nature of this dark energy and dark matter. Go on the web and ask, type in the most important questions in science, and some of the things that will pop up back at you are what, are, what is dark matter and what is dark energy. And dark energy is um, a property of space itself, and it, it, but it's a crazy property of space because when you calculate how much dark energy there should be, you get huge numbers. And when you go and measure it, you find a little bit of it. And the fact that there's none of it, the fact that it's not huge and not zero is very, very troubling. And the way it's measured is by using supernova, something that Tom did his master's degree on, looking for exploding stars, which are standard candles, and looking at standard candles that are various distances from us. And that's how can we can infer that the universe is 75% dark energy. So here's what we know to date. This is what modern cosmology has taught us. The universe started absolutely with nothing. There was nothing. But even in nothing, there is something. And that something went under, went a period of inflation. And then, and then inflation stopped, and all of the stuff in the universe was created because of all this energy that was left over. It created, you, you know, all the stuff that eventually made up our sun and you and I. And then the universe started to cool down and expand, and it expanded at a slower and slower rate because gravity was trying to pull it back together again. As it cooled, eventually protons and electrons could combine. When they did, photons started to just you know, get loose, and it created the cosmic microwave background radi radiation, which is in this room right now. 10% of the, when, back when TVs had antennas, 10% of the noise that you saw on a screen that had no channel came from the cosmic microwave background radiation. So another 400 million years went by, and then stars started to form. So there was enough gas that got pulled into these gravitational wells created by dark matter that stars started to form. And then eventually stars got together with other stars, formed galaxies. Galaxies got together with other galaxies, formed clusters of galaxies. And then about a billion years ago, the universe stopped slowing down and started to accelerate. So now I'm changing, I'm, I'm changing the tone of the, of the talk dramatically. I'm not talking about the cosmos anymore because it has nothing more to teach us about dark matter and dark energy. It's done. It's told us that there are dark, there's dark matter and dark energy out there. To learn more, we have to go to the laboratory. And this is the other end of the power of 10 scales. Now we're going down. We're not going out anymore. We're going down. And to go to... Go, to, go to to go down, we build things like accelerators, which accelerate particles to very high speeds. Can anyone tell me, can an accelerator accelerate protons to the speed of light? No. No? Why, why be sorry? That's exactly the right answer. You only be sorry if you give them the wrong answer. Um, no, the, so these things accelerate things to very, very high speeds. The speed can never go faster than the speed of light, but the energy can keep on increasing, and then they smash them together. They build detectors to detect these smashed remnants, and they look for dark matter. That's one way of looking for dark matter. That's not the way I look for dark matter. That's the way dark ma other kinds of dark matter can be um, detected. So let me, I want to get to a couple of demonstrations. So let me say that, um, let me say that it is not the only form. There's all sorts of dark matter. We're looking for one kind of dark matter. There is other kind of dark matter. And all of this dark matter is predicted by people that have way too much time on their hands, that sit in offices. They're called theorists. And they predict, and I'm joking, but you know, they, there's some really smart people out there that come up with theories of what dark, this dark matter should be. And in fact, uh, dark matter is everywhere. And we're going to have a couple of demonstrations on it right now. Now, who on earth could be calling me right now? Actually, who is it? Uh... All right, drop the signal. Oh, OK, well, we were going to demonstrate the fact that this device, this dark matter detector, just detected something. And it's your cell, and my cell phone detected a signal. And you didn't see what caused this cell phone to activate, did you? So it's one example of detecting invisible particles. And Tom is going to, dem is going to dem demonstrate a couple other means of detecting invisible particles. So a cell phone uh, sends out and receives microwaves again. So that's part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Just as visible light is part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, so are microwaves. 
Uh, another part of the electromagnetic spectrum that uh, I have a very sophisticated, uh, expensive device to detect uh, are radio waves. OPM gives you a better night's sleep than Tylenol PM because you'll spend less time lying awake. So as I, as I turn the dial, I am not conjuring Tylenol commercials or hip hop or alternative rock or country music or Rush Limbaugh out of thin air. All these things, Shania Twain, Rush Limbaugh, Al Franken, Chris Daughtry are all in this room with us right now. This room is filled with radio waves and as I change the dial, that just changes the radio frequency that this, uh, this radio is then turning into noise that we can enjoy. So uh, another example of detecting an invisible particle I have here a uh, rather innocent uh, looking teacup. Uh, this was uh, made, uh, this is called Fiesta Wear, was made uh, in the 30s to 50s, and uh, you might be impressed with this bright orange uh, glaze uh, used to make this teacup, and this bright orange glaze contains uranium oxide, which emits uh, radiation. In this case, it emits what's called alpha particles. Alpha particles are very highly energetic helium nuclei and I can detect this radiation with a Geiger counter. And as you can tell, this is a fairly uh, radioactive dish. <laughs> and uh, so the idea of, of detecting invisible particles uh, is not such a wacky, crazy idea. And if you think so, if you need some sort of technology to do it, you actually, all of you in this audience have a, a, a very highly tuned, uh, sophisticated invisible particle detector right in the middle of your face. Uh, for example, if uh, something is cooking in the oven, you can know, hey, cookies are going to be done in a few minutes. Or if you smell that uh, really, really horrible uh, cologne, you know, hey, uh, Uncle Larry is here. <laughs> and it's not because you saw Uncle Larry coming. It's because there were invisible particles emanating from Uncle Larry that you were able to then detect. In fact, uh, a very, very smart guy who lived a very long time ago named Democritus, a, a Greek philosopher, coined the term atom to describe indivisible little particles that make up all of matter. And he was inspired to do this because he smelled bed, uh, bread baking. So the, the point of all this is that it's not crazy, it's not weird, it's not strange to look for particles that you can't see. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So, we're looking for dark matter, and there's all sorts of predictions for what this dark matter might be. And here's a list of various candidates, what they call candidates for dark matter. We're looking at Lawrence Livermore Labs for this axion dark matter. And here is our, um, this is our experiment. This is in one of the buildings at Lawrence Livermore Labs. It's been there since 1994, roughly. And this is the top of the experiment. It's about not quite this high. And this is the bottom. This is the working part of the experiment, and there I am behind the crane there. And this experiment has been looking for axion dark matter since, uh, yeah, as I said, 1994 or so. And it, the way you can understand our experiment is if you understand a radio. And a radio, you know how, you know, if I take Calyx as my f example of my favorite radio station. It takes electromagnetic radiation and converts it into sound. And our experiment essentially does the exact same thing. It converts electromagnetic radiation so this is the antenna, and this is the receiver. Electromagnetic radiation so into sound, something that uh, people can listen to. Our experiment takes electromagnetic radiation emitted by the decay of dark matter and converts it into something that's that we could convert into sound, but that's not very useful, so we write it to computer disk. And the way we do this, what's the secret? Because our signal is very small, our secret is we try to minimize, there's a lot of noise, and we try to minimize that. The signal we can't do anything about, we're stuck in this galaxy. The galaxy's got dark matter, I can't do anything about that. But we try to minimize the noise. And I just showed, there were a couple examples, but perhaps Tom can give us the, a, a very clear demonstration of signal to noise. Well, Dr. Aslow's goal is to try to reduce the amount of noise so that when he detects something, he knows he's detecting real data from a real source and not just some sort of background information. And that's because what's important is the, the ratio of signal to noise. 
So for example, once again, I'm going to be trying to detect radiation from my teacup. Not working very well. Wait, there's something. There's another couple little blips. But you know, I can't really be sure that I'm recording radiation from the teacup. For all I know, anybody in here have a banana for breakfast? Bananas are a good source of potassium, which is radioactive. Potassium. So I may be detecting you, sir, right now. I can't tell. <laughs> so if I want to be sure that I'm detecting my teacup, I can't do anything about the noise. I have no control over what you had for breakfast. But what I can do is increase the signal by bringing it closer. So now I'm pretty sure I'm detecting the teacup and not you. So in our experiment, the background is not fiesta wear. Our background is thermal radiation. It's the same <coughs> thermal radiation that your stovetop puts out when, you're, when you turn it on. It's, it, what's happening is the, the atoms are bashing together. They're giving off heat, but they're also giving off light. And the way we circumvent that problem, our experiment is at, if it, at room temperature, it would be subjected to a lot of the same kind of thermal radiation, so we cool it down. And now is a demonstration to show you the power of cooling something down. Why cooling is a very good idea. So what we've got Do here, I have to do that? Or? I can do it. Okay. What I have here is some liquid nitrogen. So this is material that is about, on the Kelvin temperature scale, about 77 Kelvin. In the Fahrenheit scale, this is minus 321 degrees. So this is even colder than Minnesota was last week. <laughs> By a little. So I've got uh, a party balloon here. Uh, all the balloons in the package I got uh, have these uh, weird little stripes on them. Supposed to make him look festive, I think it makes it look like a hot dog. And observe, you know they say hot dogs plump when you cook them. Well pretty much the opposite is happening right now. So it looks like my balloon is, has uh, gotten a leak, it's deflating. But it hasn't gotten a leak, what's going on is the temperature of the liquid nitrogen is chilling the, uh, the air inside the balloon when air has very low temperature, has very low pressure. So the particles are moving very slowly, yet when I remove the air inside the balloon heats right back up, particles begin moving a lot faster, exerting a greater pressure, and I've got my hot dog back. Yay. <laughs> So Tom cooled that thing down and reduced the pressure. We cool our experiment down to reduce the radiation, but it's a very, very analogous idea. So we cool it down as much as we can, but you can't get below zero, right? Absolute this is zero, zero Kelvin. We do our best. So we have a small signal. We reduce the noise as much as we can. And what the, the signal, now I'm going to try to give you an analogy of how small our signal is. It's as if you were taking a reading light and trying to read a book when the light bulb was on the moon. You're on Earth and the light bulb is on the moon, and you're trying to read a book. That's an analogy of how tiny the signal is. Our radio is looking for a signal that's that small. So we have this lovely experiment at the lab, and they, I think, did they, Dick, do they still give tours of the lab to, for the public? So uh, there are Saturdays in the year where the, the, the public can come out, and you can have a tour of our experiment. It's, uh, you saw it in the picture there. We're on the verge of discovering dark matter, and if we did discover dark matter, it will be one more slap in the face, if you will, if it depends on your perspective, of we're not at the center of the universe like the Greeks thought. We're not at the center of our galaxy. We're not at the center of our solar system. We're not at the center of our galaxy. We're not at the center of the cluster. We're not at the center of the universe. We're not even the dominant forms of matter in the universe. Dark matter and dark energy are the, dark, are the dominant forms of matter and energy in the universe. So this is a little bit of a, it's just something to take away with you, that for 2,000 years we had a, way, a view of the universe, and it was static, and the universe was infinite, nothing ever changed, but, and there were four elements. There were earth, air, fire, and water. Now we have this picture of the universe. We know how much the universe weighs. We know what each individual slice is, but for 99% or 95% of the matter in the universe, we have no idea. We have no name to attach to it. And that is the conclusion of our talk on the dark and messy universe. 
And we are happy to entertain uh, a couple questions. <laughs> okay, who's the brave person with the first question?